Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Charles Dickens. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure to be here at the First Congregational Church. Uh, before we begin, please allow me to express two wishes. First, that you will have the uh, great imagination to suppose that we are not in a house of worship, but instead are seated around a Christmas fire listening to a ghost story. And secondly, that as we go along, if you feel disposed to give expression to any emotion, whether it be grave or gay, that you should do so with perfect freedom from restraint. Nothing on these occasions can be more gratifying to me than the knowledge that my hearers shall have something of the enjoyment that I shall have in conducting them. Oh, yes. I am joined this morning at the behest of the management by an American actress. <laughs> Miss Young. Miss Ong. Excuse me. Ong. Oh. Miss, Miss Ong. Miss Ong informs me that it is a local uh, custom to request theatre patrons to switch off their cell phones. So if you have a cell phone, whatever that may be, please switch it off at this time. So we begin a Christmas Carol in four staves. Stave one, Marley's Ghost. Marley was dead to begin with. There is no doubt whatever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it, and Scrooge's name was good upon the exchange for anything he chose to put his hand to. Old Marley was as dead as a doornail. Not that there's anything particularly dead about a doornail. I might have been inclined myself to consider a coffin nail the deadest piece of ironmongery in the trade. But the wisdom of our ancestors is in the simile, and my unhallowed hands shall not disturb it. You will therefore permit me to repeat emphatically that Marley was as dead as a doornail. <laughs> Scrooge knew he was dead. Of course he did. How could it be otherwise? Scrooge and he were partners for I don't know how many years. Scrooge was his sole executor, his sole administrator, his sole residuary legatee his sole friend, his sole mourner. Scrooge never painted out old Marley's name, however. There it stood for years afterwards above the warehouse door. Scrooge and Marley. The firm was known as Scrooge and Marley. Sometimes people new to the business called Scrooge, Scrooge, and sometimes Marley. He answered to both names. It was all the same for him. Oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand of the grindstone with old Scrooge. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. External heat and cold had little influence on him. No warmth could warm him. No cold could chill him. No wind that blew was bitterer than he. No falling snow more intent upon its purpose. No pelting rain less open to entreaty. Foul weather didn't know where to have him. And nobody ever stopped him in the streets to say with gladsome looks, Oh, my dear Scrooge, will you come see me? No beggar implored him to bestow a trifle. No child ever asked him what it was a clock. No man or woman ever once in all his life inquired the way to such and such a place as Scrooge. Even blind men's dogs seemed to know him. And when they saw him coming, would tug their masters into alleyways and wag their tails as though they said, No eye at all is better than an evil eye, dark master. <laughs> but what did Scrooge care? It was the very thing he liked, to edge his way along the crowded paths of life, warning all human sympathy to keep its distance, to live a life in which the coat was always buttoned the brow pulled long, gazing with beady steadfastness into the distance. <laughs> Once upon a time, of all the good days in the year, upon a Christmas Eve, old Scrooge sat busy in his counting house. <clears throat> it was cold, bleak, biting weather, foggy with all, and although the city clocks had just turned three, it was quite dark already. The door of Scrooge's counting house was open, that he might keep his eye upon his clerk, 
who in a dismal little cell beyond, a sort of tank, sat busy copying letters. Scrooge had a very small fire, but the clerk's fire was so very much smaller that it resembled one coal, and he couldn't replenish it, for Scrooge kept the coal box in his own room, and if the clerk had entered with the shovel, the master would predict that it would be necessary for them to part. Wherefore the clerk tied his scarf about himself and tried to warm himself at his candle, in which effort, not being a man of great imagination, he failed. Then, Merry Christmas, Uncle, God save you! It was the voice of Scrooge's nephew who'd come upon him so suddenly this was the first intimation that he had of his approach. Ah, the humbug. Christmas a humbug? You don't mean that, Uncle, I'm sure. I do. Well, it's Christmas time for you, but another time for paying bills without money. Another time for finding yourself another year older and not an hour richer. If I had my will, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. Ah, he should. Uncle! Nephew! <laughs> Do you keep Christmas in your own way? Let me keep it in mine. Keep it? But you don't keep it. Well, let me leave it alone then. Much good may it do you. Much good has it ever done you. There are many things from which I have derived good by which I have not profited. I dare say Christmas amongst the rest, but I Christmas time, when it has come around as a good time, a kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time. The only time I know of in the long calendar of the year when men and women seem by one consent to open their shut up hearts freely and to really think of those below them as fellow travelers to the grave and, and not some other race of creatures bound on separate journeys. And, and though it's never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I believe it has done me good and will do me good. And I say, God bless it. The clerk in the tank involuntarily applauded. <laughs> Another word from you and you'll keep your Christmas by losing your situation. You're quite a powerful speaker, sir. No wonder you don't go into Parliament. Oh, come, Uncle, don't be cross. Dine with us tomorrow. I'll see you in... <gasps> Yes, indeed he did. He, he said he would see him in... He went the whole length of the expression <laughs> and said that he would see him in that extremity first. Why, uncle? Why? Why did you get married? Because I fell in love. Because you fell in love. Good afternoon. Well, I'm very sorry. Uh, we've never had any quarrel to which I've been a part here, uh, but I have made my trial and homage to Christmas, and I will keep my Christmas spirit to the last. Therefore, a Merry Christmas, Uncle. Good afternoon, and a Happy New Year. Good afternoon! The nephew left without an angry word notwithstanding. The clerk, in letting him out, let another man in. A portly gentleman, pleasant to behold. Ah, Scrooge and Marley's, I believe. Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Mr. Marley has been dead for seven years. He died seven years ago this very night. Ah, well, uh, I trust I find his liberality well represented in his surviving partner. Uh, 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 at this current festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, it is more than usually desirable that we should make some slight provision for the poor and needy who suffer greatly at the time. Uh, many thousands are in want of common comforts. Hundreds of thousands are in want of common necessaries. Oh, are there no prisons? Uh, yes, plenty of prisons. And the union workhouses, they are still in operation, are they not? Well, they are. I could say they were not, under the impression they scarcely furnish Christian comfort of mind and body to the unoffending multitude. A few of us are endeavouring to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. We choose the current time because it is a time above all others when want is keenly felt and abundance rejoices. What shall I put you down for? Yeah. Nothing. You wish to be anonymous. I wish to be left alone. If you ask my wish, that is my answer. I do not make merry myself at Christmas. And I cannot afford to make idle people merry too. I help to support the prisons and the workhouses. They cost enough, and those that are badly off must go there. Many can't go there. Many would, would rather die. Ah, 
Oh, they'd rather die, they'd better do it and decrease the surplus population. Good afternoon! The cold and darkness thickened. The cold became intense. In the main court at the corner of the street, some laborers were repairing the gas pipes and had lighted a great fire in a brazier round which a, a ragged party of men and boys were gathered, warming their hands and winking their eyes before the blaze in rapture. The brightness of the shops where holly sprigs and berries crackled in the lamp heat of the windows made pale faces ruddy as they passed. The Lord Mayor, in the mighty stronghold of the mansion house, gave order to his fifty cooks and butlers to keep Christmas as a Lord Mayor's household should, and even the little tailor, whom he'd fined five shillings on the previous Sunday for being drunk and bloodthirsty in the streets, stirred up tomorrow's pudding in his little garret while his lean wife and baby sallied out to buy the beef. Foggier yet, and colder, piercing, searching, biting cold. A thin and hopeful face, gnawed and mumbled by the hungry cold as bones are gnawed by dogs, stooped down at Scrooge's keyhole. God bless ye, merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. For Jesus Christ our Saviour was born on Christmas Day. Ah, get out of it! Oh, wretched Christmas carols. <laughs> get a proper job, you hardy little like. At length, the hour of shutting up the counting house arrived. With an ill will, Scrooge, dismounting from his stool, tacitly admitted the fact to his expectant clerk in the tank, who instantly snuffed out his candle and put on his hat. You want the whole day tomorrow, I suppose? Oh, yes, sir. If quite convenient, sir. It's not convenient, and it's not fair. If I was to stop half a day's wages for it, you'd think yourself mightily ill-used, I'll be bound. Oh, yes, sir. Ah, and yet you don't think me ill -used when I pay a day's wages for no work. It is just once a year, sir. Poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. I suppose you must have the whole day. Be here all the earlier next morning. The clerk promised that he would. Scrooge walked out with a growl, and the office was closed in a twinkling, and the clerk went out down a slide at the end of a lane of boys 20 times in honour of it being Christmas Eve and then ran home to Camden Town as hard as he could pelt to play at blind man's buff. Scrooge took his usual melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern, and, having read all the day's newspapers and beguiled the rest of the evening with his banker's book, he went home to bed. He lived in chambers that had once belonged to his now-deceased partner. They were a, a gloomy suite of rooms and a, a lowering pile of a building. It was old and dreary, for nobody lived in it but Scrooge, the other rooms being let out as offices. Now, it is a fact that there was nothing at all particular about the knocker on the door of this building, except that it was rather large. Uh, it is also a fact that Scrooge had seen that knocker night and morning during his whole residence in that place. Also, that Scrooge had as little of what is known as fancy about him as any man in the city of London. And yet Scrooge, having got his key in the lock of the door, saw in the knocker, without it undergoing any intermediate process of change, not a knocker, but Marley's face. <gasps> Marley's face, with a dismal light about it, like a, like a bad lobster in a dark cellar. It was not angry or ferocious. It looked at Scrooge as Marley used to look, with ghostly spectacles turned up on its ghostly forehead. Scrooge stared fixedly at the phenomenon. <gasps> it was a knocker again. Poo poo, he said, and he closed the door with a loud bang. The sound resounded through the house like thunder. Every room above and every cask in the wine merchant's cellar below seemed to have a separate peal of echoes of its own. Scrooge was not a man to be frightened by echoes. He fastened the door, walked across the hall, and went up the stairs, slowly too, trimming his candle as he went. Up Scrooge went, not caring a button for it being very dark. Darkness is cheap, and Scrooge liked it. <laughs> but before he closed his heavy door, he looked through all of his rooms to see that all was right. He had just enough recollection of the face to desire to do that. 
bedroom, sitting room, all as they should be, small fire in the grate, bowl and spoon at the ready, little saucepan of gruel, Scrooge had a cold in his head on the hob, nobody under the bed, nobody under the sofa, nobody... <laughs> Oh, nobody in his dressing gown, which was hanging up in a very suspicious attitude against the wall. Quite satisfied, he closed his heavy door and locked himself in. Double locked himself in, which was not his custom. Thus, secured against surprise, he took off his cravat and put on his dressing gown, nightcap and slippers and sat down before the very low fire to take his gruel. As he threw his head back in the chair, his gaze happened to light upon a bell, a disused bell that hung in the corner of the room and communicated, for some reason now forgotten, with the chamber in the highest story of the building. It was with great astonishment and with a strange, inexplicable dread that as he looked, this bell began to swing. Soon it rang out loudly, and so did every bell in the house. This was succeeded by a heavy clanking sound deep down below, as if some person were dragging a chain across the casks in the wine merchant's cellar. He heard the noise much louder on the floors below, then coming up the stairs, then coming towards his door. It passed through his heavy door and a spectre entered the room before his eyes. Marley's ghost, the same face, the very same Jacob Marley in his usual pigtail, waistcoat, tights and boots, uh, and the chain he drew was clasped about his middle. It was long and wound about him like a tail, and it was made, for Scrooge observed it very closely, of cash boxes, registers, purses wrought in steel. His body was transparent, so that Scrooge, observing it and looking through the waistcoat, could see the two buttons on the coat behind. Scrooge had often heard it said that Marley had no bowels, but he never believed it until now. No, nor did he believe it even now, though he saw the phantom standing there before him and felt the chilling influence of its death-cold eyes about him and noticed the very texture of the folded kerchief bound about its head and chin. He was still incredulous. Hannah, what do you want with me? Much. Marley's voice, no doubt about that. Who are you? Ask me who I was. Who were you then? You're very particular for a ghost. In life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. You don't believe in me? No, no, I, I, I don't. What evidence would you have of my reality beyond that of your senses? I, I, I don't know. Why do you doubt your senses? Because a, a little thing affects them. A slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheats. You, you might be an undigested bit of beef, a, a blot of mustard, a crumb of cheese, a, a fragment of an underdone potato. There's more of gravy than of grave about you, whatever you are. <laughs> Scrooge was not in the habit of cracking jokes. Nor did he feel uh, by any means waggish in his heart. Uh, the truth was that he tried to be clever as a means of distracting his own attention and keeping down his terror. But how much greater was his terror when the phantom, removing the kerchief from around its head and chin, as if it was too warm to wear indoors, its lower jaw dropped down upon its breast. <coughs> Ah, mercy, dreadful apparition! Why do you trouble me? Why do spirits walk the earth? Why do they come to me? It is required of every man that in his life the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men and travel far and wide. And if that spirit goes not forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. I cannot tell you all I want. A very little more is permitted me. I cannot rest, I cannot stay, I cannot linger anywhere. In life, my spirit never roved beyond our counting house. Mark me, in life, my spirit never roved beyond the narrow confines of our money-changing hole, and many weary journeys lie before me. Oh, seven years dead. Traveling all the time, you, 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 you travel fast, 
on the wing, drop the wind. Oh, you, you, you might have got over a great quantity of ground in seven years, Jacob. Oh, blind man! Blind man! Not to know that no space of regret can make amends for one's life's opportunities missed. And I was like this man. I was once like this man. You, you, you were always a good man of business, Jacob. Business! Mankind was my business. Mercy, charity, benevolence, forbearance were all my business. The dealings of my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of my business. Scrooge was very much alarmed to hear the ghost going on at this rate and began to tremble exceedingly. Hear me, my time is nearly gone. I will, Jacob, but don't be hard on me. Don't be flowery, pray. I am here tonight to warn you that you have yet a chance and hope of escaping my fate. A chance and hope of my procuring Ebenezer. Oh, you were always a good friend to me. Thank you. You will be haunted by three spirits. Uh, is that the chance and hope to which you're referring, Jacob? <laughs> I think I'd rather not. Without their visitations, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Expect the first tonight when the bell tolls one. Expect the second on the next night at the same hour. Expect the third on the next night when the last stroke of twelve has ceased to vibrate. The spirit moved backwards, and with each step it took, the window raised itself a little, so that by the time it reached it, it was wide open. Look to see me no more, and look that for your own sake you remember what has passed between us. Whoa! Scrooge closed the window, and being from the emotion he had undergone, or the lateness of the hour, or the glimpse of the invisible world, or his grim conversation with the ghost, much in need of repose, he went straight to bed without undressing, and fell asleep on the instant. Stay two. The first of three spirits. When Scrooge awoke, it was so dark that looking out from his bed, he could scarcely distinguish the transparent windows from the opaque walls of his chamber. Until suddenly, the church clock tolled a deep, dull, hollow, melancholy. <gasps> Light flashed up in his room upon the instant, and the curtains of his bed were drawn aside by a strange figure. Like a child, yet not so much like a child as like an old man, viewed through some supernatural medium which gave it the appearance of having receded from the view and being diminished down to a child's proportions. Its hair, which hung about its neck and down its back, was white as if with age, and yet its face had not a wrinkle in it, and the tenderest bloom was on the skin. In its hand it held a branch of fresh green holly, and yet, in singular contradiction to that wintry emblem, had its dress trimmed with summer flowers. Yet the strangest thing about it was that from the crown of its head there sprung a bright, clear jet of light by which all this was visible. <laughs> Are you the spirit whose coming was foretold me? I am! Who and what are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past! Love past? No! Your past! The things that you will see with me are shadows of the things that have been. They will have no consciousness of us. Rise and walk with me. It would have been in vain for Scrooge to plead that the weather and the hour were not adapted to pedestrian purposes. The bed was warm and the thermometer a long way below freezing. That he was clad but lightly in his dressing gown, nightcap and slippers. And that he had a cold upon him at that time. The grasp, though gentle as a woman's hand, was not to be resisted. Scrooge rose, but finding that the spirit moved towards the window, he clasped its robe in supplication. I am mortal and liable to fall. Bear but a touch of my hand there, and you shall be upheld in more than this. As these words were spoken, they passed on through the wall and found themselves upon an open country road with fields on either hand. The city had entirely vanished. Not a vestige of it was to be seen. The darkness and the mist had vanished with it, for it was a cold, clear winter's morning with snow on the ground. Oh, oh good heavens. Oh, 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 
I was born in this place. I was brought up here. He was conscious of a thousand odors floating through the air, each one connected with a thousand hopes and thoughts and joys, all long, long forgotten. Your lip is trembling. And, and what is that on your cheek? <laughs> it's, it's a pimple. Hmm. Strange to have forgotten this place for so long. Let us go on. <laughs> they now stood in the busy thoroughfares of a city. It was made plain enough by the dressing of the shop windows that here too it was Christmas time. The spirit stopped beside a certain warehouse door and asked Scrooge if he knew it. Oh, know it. I was apprenticed here. I would... Oh, good heavens. Oh, good heavens, it's old Fezziwig. Oh, bless his heart, it's old Fezziwig alive again. It was old Fezziwig, an old gentleman in a Welsh wig, sitting at a desk so high that if he had been two inches taller, he must have knocked his head against the ceiling. He put down his pen and looked up at the clock, which pointed to one hour before closing. yo -ho, my boys, Ebenezer, Dick Wilkins. A living, moving portrait of Scrooge's former self. A young man entered the shop, accompanied by his fellow apprentice. You all my boys, no more work tonight. Christmas Eve, Dick, Christmas Ebenezer. Let's have those shutters up before I'm going to say Jack Robinson. Clear away, my lads. Let's have plenty of room here. Clear away? There was nothing they wouldn't have cleared away or couldn't have cleared away with old Fezziwig looking on. Every movable was packed off as if it was dismissed from public life forevermore. The floors were swept and watered. The lamps were trimmed. Fuel was heaped upon the fire. And the warehouse was as warm and dry and snug and bright a ballroom as you could hope to see upon a winter's night. In came a fiddler with a music book and tuned like 50 stomach aches. In came Mrs. Fezziwig, one vast, substantial smile. In came the three Miss Fezziwigs, beaming and lovable. In came the six young followers, <laughs> whose hearts they broke. In came all the young men and women connected with the business. In came the housemaid with her cousin, the baker. In came the cook with her brother's particular friend, the milkman. In they all came, some shyly, some boldly, some gracefully, some awkwardly, some pushing, some pulling. And away they all went, twenty pair of couples at once, hands half round, and back again the other way, down the middle, and up again, round and round in various stages of affectionate grouping. Oh, I nice to see you. Old top couple always ending up at the wrong spot. New top couple starting off as soon as they got there. All top couples at once, and not a bottom one to help them. And when this result was brought about, old Fezziwig clapped his hands to stop the dance and cried out, Well done! And the fiddler plunged his hot face into a pot of porter, especially provided for that purpose. And there were more dances, and there were forfeits, and there were more dances, and there was punch, and there was a great piece of cold roast, and a great piece of cold boiled, and there were mince pies, and plenty of beer. Tomorrow shall be my dancing day. I would my true love be in so chance to see the legend of my play, to call my true Struck 11, this domestic ball broke up, and Mr. and Mrs. Fezziwig, stationing themselves one on either side of the door and shaking hands with everyone as he or she went out, wished her, him or her a, a Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas, oh, Merry Christmas, Mr. Fezziwig, I do love your Christmas parties, it's the highlight of my year, it is. And when they'd done the same to everyone but the two apprentices, they did the same to them, and thus the happy voices faded, leaving the two lads to their beds, which were under a counter in the back shop. A small matter to make these silly folks so full of gratitude. He spent but a few pounds of your mortal money. Three or four, perhaps. Is that so much that he deserves all this praise? It isn't that, Spirit. It isn't that. He has the power to render our service light or burdensome, a pleasure or a toil. 
uh, say that his power li lies in words and looks and things so slight and insignificant it is impossible to add and count them. <laughs> the happiness he gives is quite as great as if it cost a fortune. What is the matter? Oh, nothing, nothing. Something, I think. Oh, no, 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 no. Well, I should like to say a word or two to my clerk right now, that's all. Mm. My time grows short. Quick! This was not spoken to Scrooge, nor to anyone whom he could see. But again it produced an immediate effect, for once more he saw himself, and this time he was older, a man in the prime of life. And he was not alone, but by the side of a fair young girl dressed in black, in whose eyes there were tears. It matters little, to you very little. Another idol has displaced me, and if it can comfort you in time to come, as I would have tried to do, I have no just cause to grieve. What idol has displaced you? A golden one. You fear the world too much. I have seen your nobler aspirations fall off one by one until the master passion gain engrosses you. Have I not? What then? Have I ever grown so much wiser? What then? I'm not changed towards you. Have I ever sought release from our engagement? In words, no, never. What then? In a changed nature. In an altered spirit, in another atmosphere of life, another hope at its great end. If you were free today, tomorrow, yesterday, can even I believe that you would choose a dowerless girl? For choosing her, do I not know that your repentance and regret would surely follow? I do. And I release you with a full heart for the love of him that you once were. Spirit, remove me from this place! I told you, these are the shadows of the things that have been. They are what they are. Do not blame me. Remove me. Take me back. Leave me. Haunt me no longer. As he struggled with the spirit, he became aware of being overcome by an irresistible drowsiness. Furthermore, of being in his own bedroom, he had just enough time to reel to bed before he sank into a heavy sleep. in his bedroom, there was no doubt about that, but it and his own adjoining sitting room into which he shuffled in his slippers, attracted by a great light there, had undergone a surprising transformation. The walls and ceiling were so hung with living green that it looked a perfect grove. 
The leaves of holly, mistletoe, and ivy reflected back the light as many, many little mirrors have been scattered there, and such a mighty blaze went roaring up the chimney as that petrifaction of a hearth had never known in Scrooge's time, or Marley's, or for many and many a winter season gone, heaped upon the floor to form a, a, a sort of throne were turkeys, geese, game, brawn, great joints of meat, long wreaths of sausages, sucking pigs, barrels of oysters, red-cheeked apples, juicy oranges, luscious pears, immense twelfth cakes, and great bowls of punch, and in easy state atop this couch, there sat a giant, glorious to behold. He was clothed in a simple green robe, bordered with white fur, and on its head it wore a wreath of holly set here and there with shining icicles, and in his hand it bore a torch which now it held aloft to shed its light on Scrooge, who came peeping round the door. Come in, come in and know me better, man. I am the ghost of Christmas present. <laughs> oh, you've not looked upon the like of me before? Uh, no, no, I don't think I have. I have not walked forth with the younger members of my family, meaning for I am very young. My elder brothers, born in these late years. Uh, no, I, I don't think I have. Have you, have you had many brothers, Spirit? More than 1,800! <laughs> uh, tremendous family to provide for. Oh. Spirit, lead me where you will. I went forth last night upon compulsion, and I, I learnt a lesson which is working now. Tonight, if you have aught to teach me, let me profit by it. Touch my robe. Scrooge did as he was told and held on fast. The room and all its contents vanished instantly, and again they stood upon the city streets on a snowy Christmas morning. Scrooge and the Phantom passed on, invisible, to Scrooge's clerk's house. And on the threshold, the spirit stopped and smiled and blessed Bob Cratchit's dwelling with the sprinklings of his torch. Then, up rose Mrs. Cratchit, Bob Cratchit's wife, dressed out but poorly in a twice-turned gown, brave in ribbons which are cheap and make a goodly show for sixpence, and she laid the cloth assisted by Miss Belinda Cratchit, second of her daughters, while Master Peter uh, stirred the saucepan of potatoes. Woo! And now two younger Cratchits, a boy and girl, came tearing in, screaming that outside the bakers they had smelt the goose and known it for their own. And they exalted Master Peter to the skies while he blew upon the fire until the slow potatoes, bubbling up, knocked loudly at the saucepan lid to be let out and peeled. Whatever has got your precious father, then, eh? And your brother, Tiny Tim. And Martha went as late last Christmas Day by half an hour. Here I am, Mother. Oh, Lord, bless your heart alive, my dear. How late you are. We had a deal of work to finish up last night, dear Mother, and had to clear away this morning. Oh, never mind. So long as you can, eh? <laughs> Sit you down before the fire. Have a warm, Lord bless you. No, no! His father coming. His father! Let me hide, Mother. Let me hide. Oh, go on, then. And in came little Bob the father, wrapped up in his scarf, and his threadbare clothes darned up and brushed to look seasonal, and on his shoulder, Tiny Tim. Alas, for Tiny Tim, he bore a little crutch and had his limbs supported by an iron frame. Oh, oh, where's it on more for them? Ah, uh, not coming. Not coming? Not coming on Christmas Day? Oh, well, little Tim, you We'll have everything you wish for. We'll just have to make the best of it without her. Surprise! Oh, you are a Come here, you! And the two young Cratchits hustled Tiny Tim and bore him off to the wash house that he might hear the pudding singing in the copper. And how did little Tim behave? Oh, good as gold. And better. Yeah, somehow he gets thoughtful sitting by himself so much. That's the strangest things you've ever heard. Yeah. He told me coming home that he hoped people saw him in the church because he... Because he was a cripple, and, and that it might be pleasant to them to remember on Christmas Day who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. Tim's getting strong and hearty, eh? Strong and hearty. 
His active little crunch was heard upon the floor, and back came Tiny Tim before another word was spoken, escorted by his brother and sister to his little stool by the fire, and while Bob, turning up his cuffs, as if, poor fellow, they were capable of being made more shabby, compounded some hot mixture in a jug with gin and lemons, <clears throat> Master Peter and the two ubiquitous young Cratchits went out to fetch the goose, with which they returned in high procession. Mrs. Cratchit made the gravy hissing hot. Mother, Master Peter mashed the potatoes with incredible vigour. Miss Belinda sweetened up the applesauce. Martha dusted the hot plates. Bob took Tiny Tim to his tiny little stool at the corner of the table. And the two young Cratchits set chairs for everybody, not forgetting themselves, and mounting guard upon their posts, crammed spoons into their mouths, lest they should shriek for goose before their turn came to be helped. At last, the dishes were set on and grace was said. This was followed by a breathless pause as Mrs. Cratchit, surveying all along the edge of the carving knife, prepared to plunge it into the breast. But when she did, and when the long-expected gush of stuffing issued forth, one murmur of delight rose all round the board. And even Tiny Tim, excited by the two young Cratchits, beat loudly on the table with the handle of his knife and feebly cried out, Hurrah! There never was such a goose. Bob said he didn't believe there was ever such a goose cooked. Its tenderness and flavour, size and cheapness were themes of universal admiration. Each eked out with mashed potato and apple sauce, it was a sufficient meal for the entire family. Indeed, as Mrs. Cratchit said, surveying one small atom of a bone upon the dish, we haven't finished it all yet. And yet everyone had had enough, and the two young Cratchits in particular were steeped in sage and onion to the eyebrows. But Miss Belinda, having cleared the plates, Mrs. Cratchit left the room alone, too nervous to bear any witnesses, to take the pudding up and bring it in. Suppose it should not be done enough. Suppose, suppose it should break in turning out. Suppose somebody should have got over the back wall and stolen it while we was merry with the goose. All sorts of horrors were supposed. <gasps> Hello, a great deal of steam. The pudding was out of the copper. Mmm, a smell like... Smell like, smell like a washing day. Oh, that, that was the cloth. Oh, a smell like, like an eating house and a pastry shop next door to each other with a laundresses next door to that. That was the pudding. In half a minute, back came Mrs. Cratchit, flushed but smiling proudly with the pudding like a speckled cannonball, so hard and firm and blazing in half of half a quartern of ignited brandy and bedight with Christmas holly stuck into the top. Oh, wonderful pudding. Bob Cratchit said, and calmly too, that he regarded it as the greatest success achieved by Mrs. Cratchit since our marriage. <laughs> Indeed, Mrs. Cratchit said that now the weight was off her mind. I did have some doubts about the quantity of flour. Everybody had something to say about it, but nobody said or thought that it was at all a small pudding for so large a family. Any Cratchit would have blushed to hint at such a thing. At last the dinner was all done. The plates were cleared, the hearth was swept, the contents of the jug being tasted and considered mm, perfect. Apples and oranges were placed upon the table and a shovel full of chestnuts on the fire. Then all the family drew round the hearth what Bob Cratchit called a circle, and at Bob's elbow the display of family glass, two tumblers and a custard cup without a handle. These, however, held the hot stuff from the jug, as well as golden goblets would have done, and Bob passed them out with beaming looks. Merry Christmas, my dears. God bless us all. Which everyone re-echoed. God bless us, everyone, said Tiny Tim last of all. He sat very close to his father's side on his little stool. And Bob held his withered little hand in his, as if he loved the child and dreaded that he might be taken from him. Oh, oh. Mr. Scrooge, I'll give you Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. The founder of the feast, indeed. I wish I had him here. I'll give him a piece of my mind to feast upon, and I hope he'd have an appetite for it. I do. The children 
Christmas Day. It should be Christmas Day, on which one drinks the health of such an odious, stingy, hard, unfeeling man as Mr. Scrooge. You know he is, robber. Nobody knows better than you do, poor fellow. Oh dear, Christmas Day. <laughs> I'll drink his health for his sake of the days, but not for him. Oh. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. You'll be very happy and very merry, I have no doubt. The children drank the toast after her. It was the first of their proceedings that had no heartiness in it. Tiny Tim drank it last of all, but he didn't care tuppence for it. Scrooge was the ogre of the family. The mere mention of his name cast a pall over the proceedings, which was not dispelled for a full five minutes. Afterwards, they were ten times merrier than before. From the mere relief of Scrooge, the baleful being done with, the chestnuts and the jug went round and round, and by and by they had a song about a lost boy travelling in the snow from Tiny Tim, who had a plaintive little voice and sang it very well indeed. There was nothing of high mark in this. They were not a handsome family. They were not well dressed. Their clothes were scanty. Their shoes were very far from being waterproof. And Peter possibly knew, and very likely did, the inside of a pawnbroker's. But they were happy, grateful, pleased with one another, and contented with the time. And as they faded and looked happier still in the bright sprinklings of the spirit's tortured parting, Scrooge had his eye on them and on Tiny Tim to the last. Tell me, spirit, will Tiny Tim live? Mm -hmm. I see a vacant seat in the poor chimney corner and a crutch without an owner, carefully preserved. If these shadows are not altered by the future, the child will die. Oh, oh, no spirit. No, no, kind spirit, say, say that he will live. If these shadows are not altered by the future, none other of my kind will find him here. <laughs> well, what then? If he be like to die, he'd better do it and decrease the surplus population. <laughs> it came as a great surprise to Scrooge as this scene faded to hear a hearty laugh. <laughs> It came as a much greater surprise to recognize it as his own nephews and to find himself in a bright, dry, gleaming room with a spirit standing by his side, smiling at that same nephew. <laughs> it is an even-handed, noble adjustment of things that while there is infection and disease and sorrow, there is nothing in the world so irresistibly contagious as laughter and good humor. And when Scrooge's nephew laughed, Scrooge's niece by marriage laughed as heartily as he. <laughs> and all their assembled friends, not being a bit behindhand, laughed out lustily. <laughs> he, he said that Christmas was a humbug. He believed it too. Oh, indeed, indeed, Fred said Scrooge's niece indignantly. <laughs> Bless these women, they're always in earnest. They never do anything by halves. <laughs> oh, he's a comical old fellow, to be sure. Ah, uh, not so pleasant as he might be, but, but I've nothing to say against him. Who suffers by his ill whims? Himself always. Here, he takes it upon himself to dislike us. <laughs> us! <laughs> and not to dine with us. Well, well what's the consequence? He, he don't lose much of a dinner. <laughs> Indeed. I think he loses a very good dinner. And everybody agreed. And they must have been allowed to be competent judges because they just had dinner and with dessert on the table were standing around the drawing room. Well, I'm very glad to hear it, for I don't hold much with these young housekeepers. What do you say, Topper? Topper clearly had his eye on one of Scrooge's niece's sisters, for he answered that uh, the bachelor was a wretched outcast and ought to have no right to express an opinion on the subject. At which Scrooge's niece's sister, the plump one in the lace tucker, not the one with the roses, blushed. After tea they had some music, for they were a musical family and knew what they were about when they sang a glee or a catch, especially Topper, who could growl away on the bass like a good one and never swell the large veins in his forehead or get red in the face about it. But they did not devote the whole evening to music. They did not devote the whole evening to music, Miss Young. After a while they played at forfeits, for it is good to be children sometimes, and never better than at Christmas when its mighty founder was a child himself. But first there was a game at Blind Man's Buff, 
And I no more believe the topper was blinded than I believe he had eyeballs in his boots. For the way he went after that plump sister in the lace tucker, it was an outrage against the credulity of human nature. <laughs> Wherever she went, there went he. <laughs> he wouldn't go after anybody else if you'd walked up to him and bumped into him. He would have made a feint at grabbing you and then sidled off in the direction of the plump sister. <laughs> Um, the, the, the spirit signaled to them that, that it was time for them to part. Oh, no, spirit, no, 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 here's, here's a new game. One half hour more, on, only one. It was a game called Yes and No, where Scrooge's nephew had to think of something and the others must guess what. He answering to their questions, yes or no, as the case was. The fire of questioning to which he was exposed elicited from him that he was thinking of an animal. Rather a disagreeable animal. An animal that growled sometimes and grunted sometimes and lived in London and walked about the streets and talked sometimes and wasn't sold in the marketplace. Uh, wasn't a dog or an owl or a horse or an ostrich or, or an emu or a, or a, or a bear. <laughs> At each new line of questioning, this nephew was so inexpressibly tickled that he was obliged to get off the sofa and stare. At last, the plump sister cried out. Oh, I have found it out. I know what it is, Fred. I know what it is. What is it? It's your uncle, Scrooge. The scene passed off in the breath of the last words spoken. Scrooge looked about him for the spirit and saw it no more. Then, remembering the prediction of old Jacob Marley, he lifted his eyes and beheld a solemn phantom draped and hooded, coming like a mist along the ground towards him. Stay for the last of the spirits. The phantom slowly, gravely, silently approached. As it drew near, Scrooge bent down upon his knee, for in the air through which the spirit moved, it seemed to scatter gloom and mystery. It was shrouded in a deep black garment which concealed its head its face, its form, and left nothing of it visible save one outstretched arm. He knew no more, for the spirit neither moved nor spoke. I, I am in the presence of the ghost of Christmas, yet to come, the ghost of the future. Oh, I do fear you more than any spirit I have seen. But as I know your purpose is to do me good, and as I hope to live to be another man from what I was, I, I am prepared to bear you company and do it with a grateful heart. <laughs> Will you not speak to me? Lead on, lead on, spirit. The night is waning fast, and it is precious time to me, I know. Lead on. They scarcely seemed to enter the city, for the city rather seemed to spring up about them. But there they were, in the heart of it, on the exchange amongst the merchants. The spirit stopped beside one little knot of businessmen, observing that its outstretched arm was pointed to them. Scrooge advanced to listen to their talk. No, no, I don't know much about it either way. I only know he's dead, said a great fat man with a monstrous chin. Oh, when did he die? Last night, I believe. Oh, what was the matter with him? Oh, I had no idea. Uh, hey, what's he done with all his money? Oh, left it to his company, probably. <laughs> Hasn't left it to me, that's all I know. <laughs> Scrooge was at first inclined to be surprised that the spirit should attach importance to conversation apparently so trivial. But feeling it must have some hidden purpose, he said it his mind to consider what it was likely to be. It could scarcely be supposed to have any bearing on the death of Jacob, his old partner, for that was in the past, and this ghost's presence was the future. He looked around in that place for his own image, but a, another man stood in his accustomed spot, and although the city clock pointed to his usual hour for being there, he saw no likeness of himself among the multitudes that poured in through the porch. It gave him little surprise, for he had been revolving in his mind a change of life, and he thought and hoped he saw his newborn resolutions carried out in this. They left this busy scene and went into an obscure part of the town, to a low shop where bottles, bones, iron, rags, and greasy offal were bought and sold. A grey-haired rascal of great age sat smoking a pipe. Scrooge and the Phantom came into the presence of this man, just as a woman with a heavy bundle slunk into the shop, 
and she had scarcely entered when another woman similarly laden came in too, and she was closely followed by a man in faded black. After a moment of blank astonishment, in which the man with a pipe had joined them, they all three burst into a laugh. <laughs> oh, let the charwoman alone to be first, cried she who had entered first. Let the laundress alone to be second, and let the undertaker's man alone to be third. Oh, look at your old Joey, here's a chance. <laughs> if we haven't all three met with her, meaning it. Huh? Oh, you couldn't have met in a better place, eh? You was made free of it long ago, and the other two, they ain't strangers now, are they, eh? <laughs> now, what's you got to sell then, eh? What you got to sell? <gasps> Half a minute's patience, Jill. You shall see. Oh, what odds? What odds, Mrs. Dilber? Everyone's got a right to look after themselves. He always did. And who's the worse for a loss of a few things like these, eh? Not a dead man, I suppose. If he wanted to keep him with him after he was dead, wicked old screw. Why wasn't he natural in his lifetime? If he had have been, he would have had someone with him when he was struck with death, instead of lying there gasping out his last all on his own. I, I, as the truest word that's ever spoken, and it's a judgment on him. <gasps> oh yes, oh yes, I wish it had been an heavier judgment. <laughs> you may mark my words, if I could have made off with anything else. <laughs> oh, look here, old Joe, take hold of that bundle. <laughs> Speak out plain. Let me, uh, let me know the value of it. I'm not afraid to be the first, nor afraid to let them see. All right. Oh, yeah, sure. Ooh. What you call this, then, eh? Bed curtains. Yeah, bed curtains. Yeah. And don't you drop that oil on them blankets. What? What? His blankets? Well, whose houses do you think they are? <laughs> he ain't likely to catch cold without them now, is he? <laughs> may look through that shirt till your eyes ache and you won't find a hole in it nor a threadbare place. It was the best he had. They would have wasted it by dressing him up in it if it hadn't been for me. Scrooge listened to this dialogue in horror. Oh, spirit, spirit, I, I see the case of this unhappy man may well have been my own. My, my life tends that way now, I know it. Merciful heavens, what is this? The scene had changed and now he almost touched a bare, uncurtained bed. A pale light rising in the outer air fell straight upon this bed, and on it, unwatched, unwept, uncared for, lay the body of this plundered, unknown man, a rough and unkempt cloth across his face. Oh, I cannot look, spirit. Oh, sh show me some tenderness connected with a death. This dark chamber will be forever present to me. The ghost conveyed them to poor Bob Cratchit's house, the dwelling they had visited earlier. Mrs. Cratchit and the children were seated around the fire. Quiet. Very quiet. The noisy little Cratchits were as still as statues looking up at Peter, who had a book before him. Mrs. Cratchit and the girls were engaged in needlework. Surely they were very quiet. <laughs> oh, yes, the, the colour hurts my eyes. Oh, better now. Makes them weak by candlelight. No, I wouldn't show weak eyes to your father when he comes home for all the world. <laughs> Must be near his time. Past it rather, mother, said Peter, shutting up his book. But I think that he's walked a little slower than he used these last few nights. Well, I've known him walk. Known him walk with Tiny Tim on his shoulder very fast indeed. He was very light. Your father loved him so. It was no bother. No bother. Oh, there's your father now. And in came little Bob, wrapped up in his scarf. His tea was ready for him on the hob, and they all tried who should help him to it most. And then the two young Cratchits got up on his knees and laid each child a cheek across his face, as though they said, don't mind it, father, don't be grieved. Bob was very pleasant with them and spoke cheerfully with all the family. And seeing the work upon the table, he praised the speed and industry of Mrs. Cratchit and the girls, saying they would be ready long before Sunday. Sunday? You went today then, Robert? Yes, my dear. Wish you could have gone. And you're good to see how green a place it is. But you'll see it often. I promised him I'd walk there on a Sunday. My little child. 
my little, little child. <laughs> he broke down, poor fellow. He couldn't help it. If he could have helped it, he and his child would have been further apart than perhaps they were. Spirit. Spirit. Something tells me that our parting moment is at hand. I know it, but I know not how. Tell, tell me, what, what man was that with a covered face whom we saw lying dead? The ghost of Christmas yet to come conveyed them to a wretched, ruinous, dismal graveyard. The spirit stood among the graves and pointed down to one. Before I draw nearer to that stone to which you point, answer me one thing. Are these the shadows of the, will, of the things that will be, or, or the things that may be only? Still the ghost stood among the graves, pointing to one. Men's courses will foreshadow certain ends to which if persevered in they must lead, but if the causes be departed from, the ends must change. Say it is thus with what you show me. Still the ghost was motionless as ever. Scrooge crept towards it, trembling as he went, and following the finger, read upon the stone of that neglected grave. His own name, Ebenezer Scrooge. Am I that man whom we saw lying dead? Oh no, spirit! No! No! I am not the man I was! I will not be the man I must have been but for this meeting if I have passed all hope. Why show me this? Assure me that I yet may change these shadows with an altered light. I will honor Christmas in my heart and keep it all the year. I will live in the past, the present, and the future. I will not shut out the lessons that they teach. Assure me yet that I may sponge away the writing on this stone. And lifting up his hands in one last prayer to have his fate reversed, he noticed an alteration in the phantom's hood and dress. It shrunk, collapsed, and dwindled down into a bedpost. And the bedpost was his own. The bed was his own. The room was his own. And best and happiest of all, the time was his own to make amends in. He was chirped in his transports by the church bells ringing out the lustiest peals he'd ever heard. And then running to the window, he opened it, put out his head. No fog, no night, no mist. Cold, bright, stirring, golden day. What's today? He cried, calling down to a boy in Sunday clothes. Eh? What's today, my fine fellow? Today? Why, it's Christmas Day. It's Christmas Day. It's Christmas Day! I haven't missed it! Oh, oh uh, tell me, my fine fellow, uh, do, you, uh, do you know the poulterers in the next street but one at the corner? I should hope I did. Oh, what a delightful boy. Uh, do you know if, if they've sold the prize turkey that was hanging there? Not the little prize turkey, the big one. You mean the one as big as me? Oh, what an intelligent boy. What a remarkable boy. It's a pleasure talking to him. Yes, my buck. It's hanging there right now. Go and buy it. Walk it. Oh, no, 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 I'm in earnest. Uh, go and buy it and tell the man to bring it here that I may give him direction where to take it. Come back with the man, I'll give you a shilling. Come back in less than five minutes and give you a half a crown. The boy was off like a shot. I'll send it to Bob Cratchit's house. He, he shan't know who sent it. It's twice the size of Tiny Tim. The hand in which he wrote the address was not a steady one, but write it he did and went downstairs to open the street door and await the coming of the poulterer's man. Oh, it was a turkey. It could never have stood upon its legs, that bird. It would have snapped him off in half a minute like sticks of sealing wax. Scrooge got himself dressed all in his best and at last got out into the streets. By now, the people were pouring forth as he had seen them with the ghost of Christmas present and Scrooge, walking along with his hands behind his back, regarded everyone with a delighted smile. <laughs> he looked so irresistibly pleasant in a word that three or four good-humoured fellows said, uh, Morning, sir. Merry Christmas to you. Scrooge said often afterwards that of all the blithe sounds he had heard, these were the blithest in his ears. Uh, at last, he turned his steps towards his nephew's house. He must have gone past the door a dozen times before he had the courage to go up and knock, but he made a dash and did it. Fred, 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 it is I, your Uncle Scrooge. Uh, uh, I've come to dinner, Fred. Will you let me in? Let him in? 
It's a mercy he didn't shake his arm off. He was at home in less than five minutes. Nothing could be heartier. Scrooge's niece looked just the same. Topper looked the same when he came. The plump sister looked the same when she came. Everybody looked the same when they came. Wonderful party, wonderful games, wonderful unanimity, wonderful happiness. But he was early at the office the next morning. Oh, he was early there. If he could just be there first and catch Bob Cratchit coming in late, that was the thing he'd set his heart on. He did it too. The clock struck nine. No Bob. Quarter past. No Bob. Bob was a full 18 minutes and a half behind his time. His hat was off, his scarf too, and he was sitting on his stool driving away with his pen as if he could overtake nine o'clock. Hello. What time of day do you call this then, eh? Oh, I'm very sorry, sir. I'm behind my time. You are. Yes, I think you are. Step this way, if you please. I'm very sorry, sir. It shall not be repeated. I was making rather merry myself yesterday, sir. Now, look here, my friend. I'm not going to stand for this sort of thing any longer. And therefore, and therefore, I am about to raise your salary, Bob. Merry Christmas, Bob! <laughs> A merrier Christmas, Bob, my good fellow, than I have given you in many a year. I, I, I shall raise your salary, and I shall endeavour to assist your struggling family, and we shall discuss your affairs this very afternoon over a Christmas bowl of smoking Bishop Bob. Stoke up the fires, and buy a second coal scuttle before you dot another eye, Bob Cratchit. Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all, and infinitely more, and to Tiny Tim, who did not die, he became a second father. He was as good a friend, as good a man, and as good a master as the good old city knew, or any other good old city, town, or borough in the good old world. Some people laughed to see the alteration in him, but his own heart laughed, and that was enough for him. He had no further intercourse with spirits, but lived in that respect upon the total abstinence principle ever afterwards. And it was always said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well if any man alive possessed the knowledge. May that truly be said of us and all of us. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, everyone. 